you say Mike's a little polarizing and he's, he's definitely a bit of a character and it's just his personality, his entertainment is absolutely a conscious thing that we're leaning more into because people love it. So you have to give yourself goals for maintenance after. Oh man, that was 2007 at a powerlifting meet. First ever powerlifting meet I ever did actually. Uh, those are with, um, so that's Mike over there. So I want to kick things off a few years after you met Dr. Mike at the University of Michigan gym. This eventually led you to take the subway every day as a personal trainer in New York City. So starting in 2014, it looks like you were able to find scale through digital products with the RP Diet Book 1.0 and even the OG Diet Excel templates that you'd manually email to clients. So maybe you can talk me through a highlight and a low light during this time period from either a lifting or business standpoint in as much detail as possible. I'll start with a low light. Uh, that one's easier. Uh, I remember we were actually considering a move from New York City. We lived uh, in Manhattan at the time. We had, uh, so my wife and I had two kids living in a three bedroom apartment on Upper East Side, which is, you know, just crazy. And my wife was in the process of being interviewed for a job down in Charlotte. And I remember we had to fly down. So we basically had to like fly my mom out to New York City to stay with our kids so that we could fly down to Charlotte to look for houses. And this was early 2015. And I remember, so we spent all day looking for houses. And then after that, I get home to the hotel and, you know, like I'm, I'm dead tired, right? Because we're having to travel. And we basically had like one day time window to do all this. And got back. And it's funny because you mentioned like the manually emailing all the templates. So I get back at the end of the day. I think we met with my sister because she lived down here, got some dinner. And then like, then we get back to the hotel, you know, seven, eight, nine o'clock at night. I'm like, oh, okay, cool. Now I have to work. And I had to like sit down and type out every single email. And again, you know, I was like copy and paste a lot of stuff, but then attach the right files. And yeah, it took like an hour. So it's like, I didn't know anything about automations at the time. So it was just like having to manually do all that. But, you know, eventually you figure it out and I was able to automate it. And that that allowed to actually the the real scale because you know, I couldn't imagine anyone doing that manually for longer than you know a month or two. And the, the order volume wasn't that high back then. Um, but once we figured that out, I was able to kind of see that hockey stick occur. So that was a low light. Oh, man, highlight. Um, the highlight was just probably in itself when we launched the first RP Diet Book. We didn't even sell it on our own website because we didn't, like, it wasn't even like a thing. I think all we did was accepted paypal payments from people that paid us for coaching so we sold on someone else's site but the highlight would be seeing that prove that it could actually work and that people actually were interested in you know sold i don't know a few hundred copies a few thousand copies or whatever in the first like week or so that was a highlight because for us it was a light bulb that goes oh hey we might be onto something so that that was probably i would say the highlight and was it yourself who was more excited about trying to figure out how to move things from using your time into a scalable way? Was it Mike? Was it both of you? Is that just something that you knew that, you know, scale would be required at some point to, you know, not spend all your time coaching people and sending emails? <laughs> yeah. Um, I think it's really important that, uh, it's really hard for anyone to develop a business by themselves, right? Because you have complementary skill sets. And a lot of times if you have in a partner that does something else that allows each person to just focus on what they're good at. So yeah, Mike was all, we both were kind of all set. If we could have just coached people and he would have been a professor as well. And I just would have coached people like we would have been fine. We would have been totally cool with that. Like if our lives turned out that way, it'd be like, Hey, awesome. Just, just what we want to do. But I was, yeah, again, just knew early on from not wanting to train people all the time in person that if we could figure out a way to scale this, that would be really, really cool. And so I was like, Mike, we need to figure out a way to do this. And then he's sort of the product visionary. He's like, all right, let me, let me, you know, go sit down on my computer and figure something out. So it was kind of that like combination. It wasn't really just one or the other. It was me saying, hey, we need to do this. Like we now know people are interested in this. So how do we take like our coaching model and how do we start to scale that? And that's where then I threw the idea to him, you know, lobbed it up, softball bat. He comes in and knocks it out of the park with the, the the very, very rough MVP version of the the diet templates, which again was like another solidification that people were actually interested in something like this. So that was uh, the the cool point of, of proving it out. And what was the value properly of the Excel templates? Like people are paying five, six hundred dollars a month for coaching and now for 
a hundred dollars, they can get these templates that they can execute on their own. Yeah, exactly. It's a, it's a do it yourself product. So one third, one fourth of the price of what you would normally pay. So you could probably use them for like three to six months and they cost a hundred dollars. So you're looking at what, 10, 20 bucks a month, something like that. And for a lot of people in fitness, you know, there, there's a time and a place to hire a coach and you're okay paying more, but it's not really something that you need to use forever. So if you can create something that, all right, hey, I'm going to hire a coach for three or four months to get me through, hey, I've got like a big show or a big contest or whatever it is, cool, I'm okay paying more then. But then what after that? Like I don't necessarily need to keep paying a coach hundreds or if not thousands of dollars a month beyond that. So if I had something that sort of just laid out what I needed to do, I can then go and operate myself. So that was really it. And really the way we thought about it was when we were back in college, we couldn't afford to pay a coach, but we probably could have got some money together to pay a hundred dollars to have this. And it just lays out as a blueprint for you. And like, if you know what you're doing, you could conceivably use it for like years. Cause you go, okay, I'll do this, 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 you know, I'll go from the base to cut one, to cut two, to cut three. Oh, I might be able to kind of reverse engineer that back up. So like if you were resourceful, you could use them for a, a long time. And that's really kind of what RP was when we started the scalability was, well, could people afford this that can't hire a coach? And, you know, if we think about college students, we're like, we're the perfect use case. <laughs> it's usually one of those things, right? Where they're like, if you build something for yourself, that's usually a pretty good indicator that like it might work. And then you can start to scale it after that. And so I think we were a pretty good uh, model of that, that working out. Awesome. Yeah, I think that's great that you were able to be a user of your own product somewhat there, because then you're able to understand, um, you know, the niche, who exactly wants the product, and then also what type of product improvements exist. I also think you brought up a good point where you mentioned not everyone needs a coach forever. And I think there's kind of two different personality types. There's someone who may want a coach forever or may just want the blueprint and want the new blueprint. And then there's the type of person that wants to educate themselves and learn. And I think that second half is probably the one that really ap appealed to the templates because they got that blueprint, but then they were able to maybe do some of the iterations and think through it themselves and understand why is the template structured the way it is. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, there's there's always a time and a place for stuff. And yeah, you, know, you think about like luxury services, luxury goods, right? It's always a small percentage of people that can use them. So if you can create something that's a bit more affordable, like that's how you're going to appeal to more people. And, you know, obviously we're talking about even a smaller niche just in the fitness circles. So there's a certain number of people that are willing to pay the higher level to have a coach, but predominantly most people, you know, can't afford that or can't afford it for a very long time. So, so if you have something more affordable, it just sort of makes sense. Awesome. So I want to move on. Um, you've mentioned, you know, RP, the P is kind of self-explanatory. Um, and I think that may be because you're spending your time, you know, in that fitness enthusiast kind of culture. My experience is talking to the average recreational lifter. They don't really understand periodization. So I'm curious, can you explain it in a terms that like your average recreational intermediate lifter who hasn't done anything more than increase the weight of reps could understand? Totally. I always use an analogy because most people appreciate, especially if you're into lifting, you can appreciate pro sports. So the question to ask is, do you think pro athletes train the same way in season that they do out of season? Most people would probably stop and, oh, I never really thought about that before. Probably not, right? You can imagine that how you train in season is a little bit different. And so like that's really periodization in a nutshell. You train in a certain way to set up the next phase to be more productive. So, for example, if you take a pro athlete, they're probably building foundation. They're working on specific weaknesses. They're working on something out of season. Then you get in season. like You're basically working to improve your foundation or performance so that when you get in season, you're really just trying to maintain. You're not necessarily looking to improve your performance, your strength, your hypertrophy, building, growing muscles during season because the whole point of competing in sports, especially at the highest levels, is to perform on that given day. So it's really just like I make all the improvements in the off season, and then I'm just really trying to maintain and make sure I don't lose anything, stay injury free, etc. Like that is in a nutshell periodization or think about it in terms of Olympics. Now you train four years for what? couple day events in the Olympics. So it's, it's just structuring things in a logical 
rational way that is hopefully to express your talent or your abilities on a certain given date. And that's really, you know, periodization in a nutshell. So why should a recreational lifter who goal is to maximize hypertrophy over a long period of time and doesn't have this performance-based event, why should they care about periodization and when should they start considering uh, using it as a tool? So if they're just a recreational lifter and they just, you don't necessarily have to. Okay. Now you can to get a little bit more efficiency out of your time spent in the gym. So the everyone wants to, you know, lean gains, right? The idea of building muscle, losing fat at the same time. Well, that's really hard to do if you don't have any differences in your nutrition or your training. So you can enhance your results by saying, hey, you know what? I'm actually going to spend the next two to three months training a little bit higher volume and trying to cut down and lose some body fat so that I know after that, I can then set up a more productive phase where I can start growing muscle after that. Because if you just sort of maintain, run the status quo, like you can do it. And especially if you're newer to lifting, you'll get some good gains. You'll get some good results for a certain period of time. But then you're probably going to hit that plateau at some point where they, then you need to start eking out a little bit more here and there, get a little bit more thoughtful with your approach to stuff. But like, you know, as you said, I'm kind of at a point now where like now I've competed or whatever, and I don't have any ambitions to compete as a pro because it just, the trade-offs aren't really there for me mm-hmm. to, to, to seek that out. So like, I'm just kind of maintaining. And so like, I can do that, but I know I'm making a conscious choice in my head of, I'm not going to optimize everything that I'm doing. And I'm okay with that. So like, I can just keep training hypertrophy blocks or just run like a four to six mesocycle, a four to week, four to six week long mesocycle and just keep repeating that. And like maybe around the holidays, you know, I'll kind of accidentally bulk up a little bit. And then maybe after that, I'll cut down a little bit. But for the most part, I'm just, just kind of run in maintenance. And so like you can totally do that and you'll get pretty good results. It's just a little bit of a trade-off thing where it's not going to be quite optimal. Yeah, I think that's helpful. But can you explain what a four to six week mesocycle is? Because I think a lot of people, they have like workout A and workout B and they're just doing that for months, right? So they're not even, I know you're saying you're not doing kind of the optimal periodization, but you still are thinking through like this four to six week mesocycle, which I think if you go to a a normal gym and even have someone kind of at the intermediate level, not a novice, they're not going to understand that concept. So if you could explain that, that would be helpful. Totally. Yeah. 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 Thanks for calling that out. I'm so used to thinking like that, that I almost take it for granted because like I, I only use the RP hypertrophy app now. So it's like basically, you know, four or five, six week blocks. That's how I think about it. So a lot of people don't do that and that's fine because as you get more advanced, as you get bigger and stronger, you kind of have to have some built-in periods and we call them deloads. It's essentially just a rest period. Now you can, during a deload, actually go to the gym and, and work out a little bit, but you're like usually reducing your volume or intensity a little bit. And all that is, is just to sort of reset you back, reduce your fatigue. Because like as you get bigger and stronger, if you're just always lifting, always go, 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 you know, what's going to happen? You're probably going to get injured. Something's going to happen. It'd be like taking your car and just driving forever and not really stopping to perform maintenance on it. You know, stop, change your oil, run on, rotate your tires, whatever. I'm not really a car person, but like, you know, whatever people, <laughs> people, people do on cars. But the same principle applies. Like if you just keep go, 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 go in the gym, I always like to say you're either going to proactively deload and that is like you plan some rest time. Or you're going to just go, go, go. You're going to get hurt a little bit. You're going to tweak something. You'll have to take some time off. It's not really your choice at that point. So we always like the idea where you just plan it in. Now, that all being said, like if you're newer to lifting, you can probably go three, six months at a time. And if you think about it, most people, right, if they're a recreational lifter, you know, I I just, my kids were just on spring break. So most normal people, like whatever, you go out to the beach for a week, you're not training right there. there that's your deal. Yeah. You come back, you just get back to training. So a lot of people without even thinking about it have life events happen. And so it sort of takes care of itself. But when you're a more serious fitness enthusiast and training is just part of your life, it's probably a good idea to plan some periods in, 
into your own training where you just back off a little bit, give yourself a chance to recover. Awesome. So I know you mentioned, you know, deload because of the fatigue. Do you think about the stimulus to fatigue ratio when thinking about things like exercise selection as a more advanced lifter? Yeah, a little bit. I would say one of the biggest changes that I've made, I remember when I was in my 20s, and this was before we knew as much as we do now, of course, but you'd see some like older lifters and they would be doing more machines. They wouldn't be doing maybe as many of the compound exercises. And yeah, I remember I asked Mike all the time, like, hey, like, why is that? Why is that? Why is that? What are they doing? What are they doing? Mm-hmm. And, you know, we were young and probably a little naive. And we're like, no, 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 the compound basics, right? The squats, deadlifts, presses, rows, et cetera. Like, that's where it's at. That's where it's at. You got to do that. Got to do that. Well, you know, and you can when you're in your 20s and maybe you're not as big and strong, but as you get bigger and stronger over time, those big compound lifts, like if you think you know, barbell deadlifts, well, okay, let's say you're lifting 275, 315 for reps. Hey, that's that's great. It doesn't exact as much of a toll on you as if you have to do that same thing when you're bigger and stronger, you know. 500 600 pounds for reps that just kicks your butt to a certain to another level and so you you start thinking after a while we're like i've gained a lot of muscle now how do i just like maybe i don't want to say maintain because that's not maybe the right way to look at it because if you get more advanced and want to compete you're always wanting to get a little bit better but you start to figure out or think about or use some different exercises that don't beat the crap out of you so much, but still give you a stimulus. And that's really, in essence, what stimulus to a fatigue ratio is. So if you think about it, I can deadlift, but man, I'm going to get like two sets and I'm going to be spent. I'm not going to be able to do a whole lot after that. Is that worth it? Or could I do something like back raises or maybe you know some good mornings that Yeah, I don't have to use as much weight on, but I still get lower back. I still get hamstrings. I still work it. And then I'm not so – deadlifts just kind of crush your soul. (laughs) Like, there's there's no – Yeah, 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 100%. There's there's no other way around it. But if you do some of those other things, you still have a lot of gas left in the tank to go do some other exercises and have an overall, you know, productive leg day, let's say, for example. But, yeah, if you're you're deadlifting, I don't know, 500 for six or eight reps – you do that for a couple sets, man, you're not getting in a whole lot of other volume after that. So it just becomes a, it becomes a game of trade-offs. Awesome. Thanks for explaining that. I think the uh, audience will appreciate that. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to throw out some quotes um, that either you've said in the past or you've mentioned. And just give me your first take <laughs> of what that quote means to you. Sure. <laughs> uh, so the first one is consistency over perfection. Yeah, I will. I still say that to this day. I think a lot of people overlook that, and it comes from I think good intentions. So, for intermediates or maybe even more beginners, you just, you see something online, you get really fired up, you get really motivated, and you just can't wait to get after it. Like, oh man, I'm so excited! I just want to get after it. And so, you want to do everything right, and you want to do everything all at once. It comes from a good intention. You want to get in shape. You want to do very, very well. I get it. That's awesome. But then it's just so often overlooked that when you try to be so perfect on every single thing, it's just so overwhelming and just so stressful that because a lot of people have that all or nothing mentality. And so they're like, oh, I'm all in. And then they mess up one little thing on their plan and they did, they get down on themselves. They get beat up. They get frustrated. And so what ends up happening, they just kind of abandon the plan altogether and like, oh, screw this. It's not for me. So like, if you can just overlook that and get to the point where, hey, you know what? I would rather be 85, 90% consistent for months and years rather than trying to be 100% perfect for you know a few weeks or even a couple months. You're so much better off. And you can apply that to essentially everything in life too. So uh, that's, man, that's that, that quote to me that I hopefully won't ever change on that because I think it's that important. Yeah, there's a Bruce Lee quote, it's consistency over intensity. And yeah. uh, it's it's very similar, right? It's like, there's a time when you need to be intense, but you can't be intense consistent consistently. So you just need to be consistent and put in the work and learn and put in the practice. And that's going to be the vast majority of your results. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. All right, next one is drop your ego. Yeah, drop your ego. Yeah, no, I mean, that's really, really important. Ego leads to not a whole lot of good places and 
I think that is one of the biggest lessons that I've learned from being in my 20s versus now being like I'm now 36. So before too long, I'll be 40 is it just kind of don't care as much about some of the silly stuff that you cared about earlier on. So like, I mean, for me, like, I don't really get too worked up if people say negative things online about RP or myself. I'm like, okay, all right. Like, but in my 20s, man, I would have got worked up. Like, it would probably ruin my whole day. And the word is, it comes from an ego thing. So, you know, wanting just everyone to like you. And again, it probably has good intentions, but it's not all that great. Or you know, even just being in business and being around other people man, ego can just lead you astray because you get caught up in what other people are doing or thinking that you have to do this or you have to do that. And if you start sitting back and asking yourself why, oh, then you're like, well, why is that? Do I actually really want that? Or do I think maybe I just do because other people are doing it? And I think like that's what people have to do. Um, ego is really intense, man. That um, I th- Hopefully, hopefully as people get older, they uh, can sort of disassociate with that a little bit. For sure. It still gets you though. Oh, right. Like it still gets me sometimes. I'm like, why am I doing this? Or why am I feeling I have to do this? And then it's like, it's ego or it's past results and there's expectations. And it's like, okay, I need to like get rid of that noise somehow. Like I need to get rid of that and think clearly. And it's, it's easy for it to just show up. Yeah. Yeah. Ego is can very quickly show up and you don't even realize it. And just in dealing with people like in, in our own, in RP, I, I, I'm totally cool to admit like, hey, you know, hey, that was my bad. Like, that was my mistake. And, and I don't really care anymore. I'm just like, like, I don't care. I don't have to have all the right answers. I just want, uh, the goal is to get RP better. If I have a good answer and it works, great. If other people have it, even better. Like, oh my God, that's even uh, yeah, 10 times better. So I don't care. Just awesome. what's the goal? RP gets better. How that happens? Who, who has a bit, the best ideas? I don't give a shit. <laughs> That's the right approach. Uh, so the next one is a quote from Marcus Aurelius. You have the power over your mind, not outside events. Realize this and you will find strength. Yeah, I have this uh, I, I'm downstairs in sort of a new office that I've set up. But uh, I had this quote in my upstairs office for the longest time. It's actually still there. So to me, that quote just means it's all about internal locus of control. So you can't really control other people, what they do, what they say. The only thing you really have control over is how you respond to stuff. And I think this ties really, really, really well in with ego. And you look at that and you're like, oh, okay, well, yes, so-and-so did this. So-and-so did some amazing thing. Hey, that's really cool. That's awesome. Good for them. Whereas like when you're in your 20s, like I would remember I would see some some people like, succeeding and i would almost get mad i would be like huh damn it why is that not me like now i'm just like hey that's awesome good for them maybe we can do something cool too yeah i i can find this challenging at times because i i'm actually really good at this like just knowing okay what's in my control what's not in my control it's how i react to it but i sometimes i find the people around me uh expect me to get more angry than i do uh and that can actually be a challenge. It's like, why aren't you as upset as I am with this? And I'm like, oh, because I'm, you know, I explain it logically. And uh, that doesn't resonate with everyone all the time. <laughs> so it certainly doesn't. So real quick story. So um, my wife and I had to drop off a car. We ran out of car for a week because we had to drive all over the place and we didn't want to use our own, our, you know, own cars and whatnot. And so we were at this uh, car rental place dropping it off and we just heard this lady on the phone standing outside and she was just screaming and yelling. And I just, my first thought was like, that's a really emotional reaction. Like that, that sucks. And I was totally guilty of this too. I just think it's more of like a maturity thing where like some stuff would just really set me off before, you know, my wife would say I was probably a little bit of a hothead. And I think sometimes people pride themselves on being a hothead. Oh, like, Oh, that's just how I am. It's like, that sucks. Like you, you, you're not going to think very clear. It's like now when stuff happens, like, yeah, of course, like, like, yeah, deep down, like I might be a little upset, but I just really go back to like, Hey, just calm, cool, collected. Like that's my main job. Like just, just chill out. Shit hits the fan. It's my job to just keep it even cool and be like, all right, 
okay, it happened. Now what do we do? Because I can be upset about it, but is that being upset going to actually lead to a productive solution or outcome? No, almost certainly not. Because when you're screaming and yelling, you're a hothead. Like one, it's just always so funny. Oh, funny is the right word. But like you said, when you look around and see other people, uh, so I got another little side story. Like we, my wife and I go to uh, Panthers games. We live here in Charlotte and like, I'm not a Panthers fan. It just, it doesn't, I I just don't have that emotional tie to the team. So like when they don't do well, the other people sitting next to me get really, really upset. And I just kind of laugh because like, I'm so detached from it that I just laugh when I see the other people getting really upset. And what makes me laugh the most is because I find it, you know, I find it comical that they're reacting so strongly to it. And then I think of how I get when I watch like Michigan and that's my yeah. thing, right? I went to the university of Michigan and it is a very emotional thing for me. People, pro- I know people laugh at me. They're like, this guy is insane. And so it's just, yeah, it's that, it's that difference. But when you watch other people do it, it is comical. And then like, it's so hard when it's then happening to you to like step outside of that and detach. Like it, it's just so funny, man. It, uh, it always, it always makes me laugh. Yeah. For me, I've been in this like dynasty fantasy basketball league with my friends for like 15 years and I care way too much. Yeah. Like it'll ruin my day. And it's so stupid in terms of like, it's not even for a lot of money. It's more just like bragging rights with the boys, totally. but it's like, totally. it matters. It matters a lot. Yeah. So if I lose in the fantasy playoffs, like, my day's ruined. So I get it. <laughs> All right. I got, I got one more here. Uh, it's fairly easy to lose weight, but it's entirely different to actually maintain those results after. Yeah. 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 Losing weight's not really that hard. Cause like you could do 50 different diets and lose weight, but 49 of those diets, let's call 48. will get you from a to B, but there's no plan after that. So like, they'll tell you what to do to lose 10, 15, 20 pounds. And usually they want to do it faster. And usually diets that lose weight faster, you tend to rebound it back up faster as well. So it's like, you need to have a more comprehensive plan. It's like, all right, I want to get from A to B. Okay, great. Now, what do I do after that? Because getting results is cool. It'd be like winning the lottery. Well, that would be great to win the lottery, right? You win millions of dollars. What happens if you spend it all in the first couple of like weeks? Well, then you're right back to where you started. Like nothing really that exciting happened. And you might even be in worse shape because you might have spent or bought all this stuff and then it has expenses to maintain. And now you've lost all that money. It's like now you're actually worse off. So the same can apply when you're dieting is you, if you don't develop the right habits, if you don't develop the right mindset around it, you might lose 10, 15 pounds, but then there's no plan in place after to maintain it. Well, you're just going to rebound right back up and maybe just fall off the wagon even more because now you're even more discouraged. So it like could end up worse than you started because you don't have a plan for after. Yeah. I think you were mentioning before, like a lot of people are on or off. And I think that idea of like, I'm on eating, you know, clean foods or I'm off is just, it's a trap, right? It's kind of, it's more like what foods can I enjoy long-term that can have me adhere to my goals over a long period, but people don't like that. That's not sexy. I tell you what, I just did a little diet myself and I even struggle with this and I've done so many diets, but now that I'm done with it, and this is where the maintenance is a really hard thing because like, and I do have a little bit of that on off switch. And so when I was dieting, it's like this eating junk foods or whatever, it's just, it's it's not even an option. Cause I'm like, Nope, I'm dialed in. Great. And I know a lot of other people struggle with this too. It's like, well, now my diet's over. It's not even that I really want those things, but I just, it's like, I can. And then it's a slippery slope because you're like, oh, okay, well, I'll just have, you know, so I intentionally ended my diet the day of my daughter's 10th birthday. So we had you know, birthday cake or whatever, whatever. And then it was Easter. And then we were on spring break and, you know, family was in town. So it's just mm-hmm. like, well, and then everyone wants to go get ice cream. And One yada, month yada, later. <laughs> yeah. And that's the really hard part. So I uh, maintenance to me and a lot of other people out there is harder than dieting, which seems weird. But once you get your intended results, how do you maintain it without just completely backsliding to where you were originally? For me, that's the case as well. Like cutting's easy, like relatively easy because yep. I have a clear goal. I know how to accomplish it. And I have some willpower and motivation at the time. Yep. I just go, right? Like well, however many weeks it is, be under the calories. Cool. 
But then maintaining is like, it's this lifelong journey and social obligations are going to come and th things are going to happen. So it, it is definitely more challenging. And I actually think more people should do structured maintenance phases because yeah. I think a lot of people will cut and then they'll go into a bulk right away. But let's, if you're an athlete, that's very different than if you were overweight and you cut, you need to like maintain for a while and be like, can I maintain this body composition? Yeah. So a couple of my colleagues had some, I think, really good feedback for that, where like when you end a diet, like you should not dive right back into the really tasty foods. You just add back in. So you basically just take what you're eating at the end of your diet and you just add in more like normal clean food for a couple of weeks. And if you do that for a couple of weeks, you can probably not balloon up in weight. You're getting to eat a little bit more. So you're not going to hopefully be you know, psychologically burdened with that, the, the fat loss restrictions. And then you, you can start to incorporate some of those tastier food after a couple of weeks when those cravings have hopefully subsided because man, I know this happens a lot. Like early on, we made this mistake all the time. We would, and, and I say this and I literally just did the same thing here, right? Like I ended a diet and then I had all these things set up. Maybe not the best. But I also knew I wasn't going to diet through because I'm like, I'm not dieting for anything particular. So I'm like, I'm not going to diet through my daughter's work, you know, and all this. So I, I made the conscious trade off. But in a previous diet, what I would do is I ended and then I think I had a couple different like filming or video things in the weeks after. So I had a reason to stay on track for like a month after. And then I started to incorporate some of the fun stuff after that for me worked out a lot better because it's like you said, you had the goal when you have the goal cutting, it's a lot easier. It's almost like you have to give yourself goals for maintenance after to ease back into it. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's really interesting stuff. It, you were mentioning like when you're traveling, like that's when a lot of people take the deload, but if you have that same approach where you diet the the day before you go to the beach, you're more likely to probably like rebound on that cruise or all inclusive, but you also don't want to cut your, uh, your cut two weeks short and give yourself that time because you want to be in the best possible shape. Right. So I think for, for, you know, average people, that's a huge challenge. It is. So, I mean, we actually would probably lean at RP to being like, yeah, you don't want to diet all the way up to a vacation like that or, or a wedding. That's another big one that a lot of people are cutting for. It's like you have to give yourself a little bit of grace beard because when you're at the very tail end of a cut, like let's be honest, you're going to be hangry. Yeah. You're going to be stressed out. You're going to be a little more emotional. You might be more more apt to you know snap at people. That's not really something you want when you're in the last couple of days leading up to like a big important event or you know exams, wedding, whatever it is. You you probably want to give yourself a, a couple week buffer there. But I hear you. Like, well, I'm not going to look quite as good. Yeah, but if you don't go overboard, it's not such a huge difference there. And psychologically, you'll probably be a lot better off. Yeah, but you're you're going to sleep better, and you probably won't snap on your family the day before your wedding. So, w weigh the two options, right? Cool. That's a very logical approach, though. Again, <laughs> uh, if, you, if you can approach it logically, it makes a lot of sense. If you uh, come from a more emotional standpoint, uh, you might be worse off. For sure. All right. So you mentioned hedge fund renaissance technologies as an inspiration for your company. Um, for those that don't know, it has legendary investor Jim Simons. He was a mathematician and an expert in pattern recognition, and they had major overperformance. So I'm curious... Uh, what current patterns or trends are you most excited about in the fitness space and why? In the fitness space? Uh, so normally we just, here's how we thought about it. We thought if we could apply the same thing, right? So if we can make people slightly more successful than the not, right? So the odds of them succeeding in a given diet or training program, or let's call it 60-40, and that's kind of like how they did it. It uh, it ran tech, so they had algorithms that would outperform everyone else. Oh yeah, not everything was a winner, but if they had more winners than losers, like their net outcome is going to just right. And they, I want to say they they averaged something like I don't know twenty to twenty five percent returns over like a couple decades. Like it was just absolutely it's, wild. It's it's way more than that. Wait, yeah, it, right. Okay, it was, it was I think it was like sixty six percent before fees. Like it is a major overperformance. 
but it's also like a one of one math physics genius doing pattern recognition, right? So, <laughs> yeah, 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 right. Um, wild, absolutely wild. So, we how we applied it was just we want to do something similar where people don't have to be stuck using like the status quo or someone just saying a coach saying, Hey, you need to do X, Y, and Z. And then you're like, why? And they don't really have a good reason. So we want to try to systematize the process. Like, no, like you just do this. And if you do this, like your chances of succeeding are going to be very, very high. Um, so that's like, that's how we intended to use that model ourselves. It's like, we don't want to just rely on random stuff or hearsay, or they just did it because that's how they've always done it. It's like, no, 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 there's got to be a better approach. Like there's got to be a better evidence approach. Um, so that's kind of part A to the answer. Part B would be what patterns are coming up? I think the patterns that I've seen personally. So when we got into RP, we were pretty heavily into like the CrossFit space. And back then everything was paleo. Okay. And the clear pattern has now moved to like almost everyone's macros. I don't hear anyone doing paleo anymore. And I think that's even probably even more broad in like the fitness space in general. Like everyone's all about macros now so that's why you see an abundance of apps out there that help you count track your macros and all that i think that's a big pattern i think overall in general the shift towards a slight more evidence-based approach has also occurred over the last decade i would say that's a really big pattern because you see a lot more people now you know 10 years ago when i don't know rp started or even before we started very few people out there that were quote unquote, you know, evidence based. I think like Lane Norton was one of the first ones. Obviously, he's still around, but now there's a lot more people out there. So I think that's a huge pattern that's also emerged. I would say those are probably the two big ones that stick out to me. Awesome. And one other thing that I feel may be similar to Renaissance Technologies is uh, hiring a lot of kind of A level PhDs. Was that intentional? Yeah, it was totally intentional. The good news is we had Mike at um, ETSU, so probably the best spot in America to go for a sport physiology PhD program. And so he just had a lot of people around him that were, you know, one, really smart. They're getting their PhDs and they cared about this stuff because why would you pursue a PhD in sport physiology unless you really cared about lifting and nutrition and stuff like that? So that's really where we started hiring a lot of our coaches from. And then, again, this certainly is not for everyone, but how we kind of approach things is we would rather hire, you know, one more senior level person that doesn't require as much management rather than hiring, you know, three junior folks that then you have to manage and then be just managing those folks becomes a, a bigger burden. So like, we're okay. Maybe paying a little bit more for like top level people that have been around for a while. Um, that's kind of how we approach things again, not for everyone, but you know, different companies have different cultures. And so that's just how we want to be. Yeah, hire smart people and get out of the way. <laughs> Dude, if you want to sum up my approach to business right there, that's essentially it. Yeah, that's mine too. Hire smart people, work with smart people, get out of the way. You, you know the quote where it's like, if if you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room. I've, that's never been a problem for me. So Awesome. Uh, so I want to touch on social media. Um, I feel like there's a part of RP success that has to do with getting into social media at the right time. Um, and it seems like it's something that you've potentially doubled down on in the last year. I see Dr. Mike kind of getting out there more in the general population, maybe even being a little bit more polarizing at times. Is that something that you're consciously doing for the business or just something that is, is naturally happening? All right. So I'm going to attack this in two parts too, because the first part was a little bit of good timing on Instagram when we first started can we go back to there were not a million fitness coaches out there a decade ago. And so we got on the Instagram train pretty early on and we caught some of the waves and I was the one that ran that. I loved it. I just, I sort of gamified it like, Hey, what works? What doesn't work? What are some different things that we can do? And it worked really well. I think I helped get us up to like over 500 K on Instagram. Um, and then I was like, yeah, this doesn't make sense for me to keep running this. Um, so definitely we're on the good timing there. For YouTube, I don't necessarily think it was a timing thing or, you know, quote unquote luck. Uh, it was absolutely a conscious effort. And a big part of this was my own mistake of thinking that it's funny that you say Mike's a little polarizing and he's he's definitely a bit of a character. And it's just his personality, his entertainment is absolutely a conscious thing that we're leaning more into because people love it. 
Mm -hmm. And you want to learn from people that are funny, that are engaging, that can also teach you stuff along the way. If you are a really dry, boring person, like there's a reason that he is on the YouTube channel doing it all. I remember sitting in some of his classes at the University of Central Missouri in 2014, a decade ago, almost to the day, because it was in the spring of yeah 2014 after my daughter was born. She just turned 10. And I went out there and visited, and I sat in on one of his classes, and I just thought to myself, this is a travesty that he's only teaching 25, 30 people in this class. He should be doing it to 25, 30,000, you know, millions of people because he just has it. He has the gift of the gab. Like not everyone has it. So like there's a reason and we just started leaning more into it. And I absolutely wrongly assume that we should just try to be very even keel and, and mellow, right? Like as a business owner, like you kind of think that because you're like, oh, I don't want to necessarily upset people over here or over here. Everyone's a potential customer. And then mm -hmm. you learn more and you're like, well, no, you don't want to be for everyone. It's totally fine not to be for some people. So we just started to lean more and more into that. And we've sort of developed our, a bit more of our niche, more of our crowd audience, and people love it. And the results tend to back that up. So. And man, what's really, really interesting too is like you look around and you see all these other people that have done amazing things from developing a YouTube audience. The the what the the Paul brothers, uh Mr. Beast. Like those are two really big ones, but I just yeah. saw another one. I never really even heard of them. Um oh is it dude perfect or something like that? Do do, do you know who that is? Kind of. So like Someone mentioned it to me recently and I didn't go check on YouTube, but obviously Mr. Beast, like every kid wants Feastables. They don't want anything else. They just want Feastables because it's cool and prime, yeah. right? Like that's. Yeah, cool. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, man, there's really something to YouTube and like, you can really develop like this huge, just amazing following from, from just, you know, being yourself. And it's not just education. It's also entertainment. People want to be entertained. Like YouTube is more or less where everyone goes for entertainment. I mean, my, my kids watch YouTube all the time. Um, I had funny stories. So uh, my son is in sixth grade. So they're doing a, a career day and like they were, they were sending out emails, like trying to recruit people to come in. And I was like, I was like, Hey, and I was like, Hey, do you want me to do this? And of course his answer is no. And I laughed and I'm like, Hey, I'm going to volunteer anyways. And they have you fill out some stuff. And so I like made the, made sure that I put on there like, oh, we've got a pretty big YouTube channel. Cause like every kid in the sixth grade is going to think that's amazing. So uh, yeah, that's the cool thing, right? Nothing else. Yes. That's the cool thing for sure. Totally. And like, you know, like, w w would I have applied if we, if we didn't have that? And I don't know, maybe, maybe not, but like, at least that's something that everyone's going to like ears are going to perk up for a 12 year old boy, uh, probably a girl too. Like, oh, <laughs> Oh, YouTube. Oh, okay. Like, oh, hey, I'll listen, you know, make some jokes about it or whatever. But like, man, just make stuff fun, like fun to learn. And that's what Mike does, man. He's He's got the gift of the gab. So totally. Let's just lean into it and let him, let him use his humor. Cause awesome. he's, and I've known him since 2007. He, he hasn't changed. He's always been like that. Okay. It's just now he has a little bit more of like, Oh, that's okay that I can lean into my personality. And for the longest time, I was like, dude, stop doing that. Stop doing that. Stop doing that. I was completely wrong. Okay. Yeah. Leaning into the personality. And then when you get kind of that validation, it's easier to open up more and more. And it becomes a snowball effect, man. It's crazy. Yeah. Awesome. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to throw some uh, pictures on the screen. And for the first couple, just tell me your, your first thoughts, what comes <laughs> to mind. All right. Oh boy. Okay. Oh man, that was 2007 at a powerlifting meet. First ever powerlifting meet I ever did, actually. Uh, those are with, um, so that's Mike over there. And uh, one of my other friends I'm going to see here in a month. I haven't seen him in, pro I don't know, probably a decade. He lives out in Seattle. So I'm, I'm really excited. I'm going to go see him soon. But these are, man, these are people that I'm still very good friends with to this day. And that picture was taken in 2007. That was basically the beginning of my very serious fitness journey. Like that was, arguably i don't want to say day one but yeah, pretty, pretty it was early close. it when i first saw the photo i thought uh mike had a green mohawk 
Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. A, there's a bush in the back, and I was like, oh, you had a green mohawk. And then I put it together that there was not a green mohawk. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it, it does look like it. All right, next one. Yeah, good times, man. Good times. I was at the Arnold uh, a couple years ago. Yeah. Sweet. Uh, so for the next few, I want you to tell me if there's uh, something that sticks out or something that you've uh, learned from them. So the first one is uh, Kobe or MJ. It's two of my favorite athletes of all time, actually. I grew up a huge Jordan fan. Uh, I had like the jersey, the shorts. I would you know, watch the NBA finals every year, cheering them on. Um, uh, work ethic. So, okay. well, maybe two things. Work ethic, to me, is slightly more of a Kobe thing, although I'm not trying to say Jordan was not a hard worker. That would be false. But Kobe's the three-in-the-morning guy, so slightly different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But Jordan is more of like the chip-on-your-shoulder mentality. And, you know, I didn't realize that I had some of the, Well, I didn't realize how much that related to me until I watched the Last Dance documentary. Okay. All right, next one is Jeff Bezos. Jeff Bezos. Hey, he's in pretty good shape, man. You look at him now versus like, you know, 20 years ago when they showed him like the early days of Amazon. Crazy. Dude, it's wild. <laughs> Props to Jeff Bezos. Uh, Jeff Bezos, man, just I Amazon. I, I love Amazon. I use it probably every single day. Uh, I know a lot of people like complain about him or whatever, but you think about the value that he's provided to the world and just like how fast you can get things. We're talking like anything and everything to your door and the same day, next day, at worst, like two days. Wow. Crazy. Crazy. Yeah. I like, what I think what's interesting about Bezos is he's so focused on the customer and not the competitors. And I think that's been really important for him. He's just like, how can I provide a better customer experience? And that's why we use Amazon and don't one, even look anywhere else. One click. One click. All right. Last one here. Tom Brady. The man, the myth, the legend. So that's his in a Michigan uniform, too. Uh, yeah, w Tom Brady, man. We want to talk about someone that uh, exceeded every expectation ever thought of him. He was he was decent at Michigan, but no one thought he'd, you know, if he became a starting quarterback, people would have probably been like, oh, okay, that's pretty cool, like, given, given his college experience. But um, seven Super Bowls, it's crazy. It's, he's the man. I think he was uh, he was drafted as a catcher in baseball too. Like it was not expected for him to be like the goat. <laughs> no, not a single person I think would have predicted him to be the goat. That's not an exaggeration. I don't even know if he he would have thought it. Why do you think it is? Do you think it's work ethic? Do you think it's consistently getting better? Also, times with having the right coach and being in the right spot. Like, why do you think he is Tom Probably. Brady? Probably a combination of all of those things. Um, I, th I think it's really hard to pinpoint like any particular one, but he probably had the right mindset. I know he was a really hard worker. Um, probably went into a pretty good situation in New England with good people around him. It's like, you know, I, I mentioned before that my wife and I go to Panthers games. I mean, if you get put into a bad situation, like look at Bryce Young, drafted number one overall. Yep. But man, they didn't really set him up to succeed. He's got no offense around him. Defense is so so. You give up your number one draft pick this year. So, like, you're not even able to put another cornerstone piece with him. Is he really that much better or worse than um, CJ Stroud? Yeah. It pains me to say that. He's had an amazing year because he's a Buckeye. But, like, are they that much different? Let's flip the roles, right? Let's say CJ Stroud went number one. We're probably not talking about him setting all these crazy rookie records, being this, you know, quote unquote phenom. Maybe that's Bryce Young. Yeah. Yeah. Situation matters, right? It matters a lot. Yeah. All right. So I'm going to end today off with a fun question here. It's probably the hardest question I've asked you today. What is your Mount Rushmore, your top four University of Michigan athletes that play team sports? <laughs> I played team sports. Ah, hmm. So, uh, like Blake Corum. I'm writing these down too. Uh, I'm going to be. This is the important question, right? 
It's absolutely the most important question. <laughs> I'm going to go JJ McCarthy because I think he is a testament to uh, leadership and intangible qualities because he's skyrocketed up the NFL draft boards. And like he is very physically talented, but a lot of people want to be like, oh, well, he didn't have like these crazy stats or whatever. He didn't care, man. He's the proverbial, like, it's all about the team. Didn't care if he was throwing for 50 touchdowns a year. He's just like, I'm, I want to be a winner. I, like, and by the way, like he is a hard ass worker. I've heard many stories, him and Blake Corn, or I'm sorry, not actually Blake Corn, but they would stay after their freshman year. They would get back from road trips and they would stay after and they would throw, they would do all these things. Mm-hmm. So um you got Charles Woodson. Obviously. He's just so good. <sighs> I mean, I just have such recency bias on this. The the next one that I would say, I mean, I could go a couple different ways, but I would probably go with Aiden Hutchinson too. Okay. Because one, like he led the Lions to almost a Super Bowl. He stayed in Detroit, was drafted in Detroit, led Michigan to not having beaten Ohio State for a decade, led him to to doing all that. And he's got to be on there. But like growing up when I was in high school and I really became a huge Michigan fan, um, Braylon Edwards was my favorite player. So okay. I don't know if, do you know who that is? I don't. Yeah. Uh, he was drafted, I think, number three overall by the Cleveland Browns in 2003 or four, probably four. Um, I just remember shaking his hand one time and like his hand like went to here. Double your size? Yeah. It yeah, literally yeah. double my size. I was like, oh my God, that's crazy. This he was here. <laughs> yep. Awesome. Crazy, man. Genetics. Genetics plays a huge role. Like, there's, you a the of, there's a lot of, I'm a big like uh, basketball fan. So people like Chris Weber, for example, come to mind for me. You, you know what? Chris Weber, man. I, I was thinking about like, you could probably include someone from the Fab Five on here. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Nick, thanks so much for your time today. Uh, where can everyone find you? 